Thanks, Kirilak, and thanks for um, all our statements today um, and our other witnesses. This has been a kind of very protracted um, uh, last five years, to say the least, uh, for those that are trying to get access to medicinal cannabis for their children or themselves. And it's been extremely frustrating, to say the least, and many people will be scratching their head and saying why it has taken so long uh, to this, for this process to begin. And the good news is that the process is beginning in, in a couple of weeks under, under prescription. Uh, my first question is in relation to the, the MCAP itself, and it's good that people will get a you know, prescription as of uh, in the next couple of weeks, but how many clinicians have registered thus far to the MCAP, and have they registered um, you know, patients under their care at the moment? Uh, clinicians don't register themselves for the MCAP. They, so we get an application form from the clinicians. Uh, given there hasn't been any product in the market that people could register under the MCAP, we haven't had registrations to date. Okay. So, so I, would uh, expect that, I would expect that would commence once the, once the uh, product is available. Okay. So once the, once the product comes available as in mid-October, then uh, the specialists under the, the three conditions, then they will uh, prescribe... Uh, their patients under their care, the particular product, particularly can of apple. That's the way it will work, I presume. Yes, uh, yeah, and in advance of doing that, they will send us a registration number so we can, sorry, they will send us a registration application so that we can place that person on the register and provide a CMUR number. Right. And how long would that process take? How, lo how long would it take? It's yeah. When we get the form? Yeah. We, we would be turning that around within, you know, we would try the same day or next day. Okay, yeah. so it, it, could, it could, in the next three to four weeks, um, you know, patients under the care of that specialist could be prescribed medical cannabis, well, the canny apple, that product, they could have it, you know, as under prescription in the next three to four weeks. Yes, subject to the consultants deciding that that was an appropriate product to use in the, in the case of the individual patient, yeah. And is there yes. any indications thus far that is there, will there be kind of an uptake in relation to clinicians kind of having an interest in the programme? Because a number of specialists came out in August saying that they were very concerned in relation to uh, some of the products that are available under the programme. Again, it would be my expectation that with the, with Epidialogs getting a market authorisation, I think that for the epilepsy side, and actually maybe Professor Lynch might be a better person, place to answer this, but from from, from my perspective, my understanding is if Epidiolux is, is reimbursed, that, that clinicians are most likely to move towards that, given it would be a licensed medicine and they may feel that, that sorry, there would be clinical trials uh, that would have been ta taking place around that. But I should stop and actually let Professor Lynch in there, I think it would be more appropriate. Um, th thank you, Deputy. I, I think you've raised a very important point. Um, and for us, uh, as clinicians looking after patients with epilepsy, um, the evidence base is for pure CBD products, and there is no evidence base for products which contain a component of THC. Uh, Canapa, which is which is the current the product that has been mentioned a couple of times here, has a significant component of THC, uh, and there is no scientific evidence base for use of such a product for epilepsy. Uh, Epidiolex, which is the pharmaceutical product which has been mentioned, is a pure CBD product. Um, so from the very beginning, uh, when, when myself and my colleagues have engaged with HSE and the Department of Health going back to 2016 on this, what we are looking for is a reliable, properly formulated, uh, pure CBD or as close to pure CBD as we can get product that we can prescribe for our patients. Um, and presently, that is not uh, available through what is currently coming through the MCAP and uh, and as has been stated by my Department of Health and HSE colleagues, uh, if Epidiolex gets approved for reimbursement, uh, that will solve that problem. And we sincerely hope that that will happen. But we, we would not, I can speak for my colleagues, uh, that we would not be prescribing Canopil because that has a significant THC component and there is no evidence base for, for that, such a product to be effective uh, for uh, children and adults with epilepsy. Okay. Well, that's kind of 
I mean, it's a strange statement because if it's going to be prescribable in the next couple of weeks, and you as a specialist are saying, like, you would not prescribe it to your patients, then who's going to prescribe it? Well, I, 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 I agree it's a, it's, it's a strange situation. I, I have no control over what products have been applied for and approved through the MCAP. What I want very clearly is a pure CBD product. Uh, and the, and the, the, med, the HSC guidelines document, which came out of our committee review, very clearly stated that that's what we wanted for epilepsy. Um, but the uh, MCAP as set up, and I, I'm, I'm not an expert on legislation and on the niceties of what can or cannot be submitted, it seems to be designed for, for products which contain a component of THC. Okay. Um, you... And that is the problem that we have at present. I, and none of, it, of, of my uh, desire or making, I want to be able to prescribe a pure CBD product for my patients, and I want it as soon as possible. Okay. Just in relation to the review, the scientific review, uh, which is you know, was done in 2017, obviously things have moved on yeah. for evidence-based yeah. medicines around medical cannabis. Uh, does the HPRA envisage uh, that you know other conditions will be included in the program? Because the program itself is very, very restrictive, and you could have a situation where only a handful can get access. Uh, you, would, you could have a situation where more people could have access via the ministerial program uh, rather than the program itself. Um, so, is there a basis to include other conditions? Because uh, the omission of chronic pain, uh, I think, was very controversial in 2017. And I think, in my understanding, that the Danish medical cannabis access program includes neurological pain um, because there's an unmet need for that particular kind of uh, condition, uh, you know, around chronic pain. So, will the review look at other, including other conditions, uh, over the next, you know, the next six months? Um, I'll probably leave that to the people who are working on setting up the new review. I, I can speak to when the previous review looked at all conditions, including chronic pain and including cancer and, and palliative care situations, and looked at very carefully at the evidence in all of those areas. So I, I'm going to leave it back to the to the, the people from the HPRA uh, maybe to answer about how the new. I'm sure the new review will be looking at that. Well, leave them to speak to them. Thank you very much. Look, I'm happy to start here, and I might pull in my colleague Gornia as well on some of the questions there, if that is okay, Chair. And Gino, um, just to or Deputy Kenny, just to answer your question. Um, what I will say in this is, yes, you are right. The, the Danish aid, the Danish system does include uh, chronic pain as one of the indications for which cannabis can be accessed. And I mean, when we looked at this back in 2016, 2017, at that time, pay, um, we really felt that. Although on one level it appeared there were, you know, clinical trials that had been kind of, um, that had looked at the area of chronic pain. We couldn't, the evidence base just wasn't there to be able to stand over its inclusion as one of the indications. And there were many reasons for that. First of all, the quality of the clinical trials was quite poor. Many of them were not what we call randomized control clinical trials, which would really be considered, you know, best design, removing of bias. So you couldn't draw conclusions for them. Pain had been studied across multiple different areas using different cohorts of patients, using different formulations, and the evidence just, just wasn't there. Honestly, if I would say to you from what we know about this, I would say the situation possibly hasn't moved on a huge amount since that period of time. And there has been quite a comprehensive review carried out by the International Association for the Study of Pain. And I will get Gronje to come in on this point because she has all the expertise on it. So I, you know, I, I, I would honestly say to you, I, I don't think the situation from our viewpoint would be different. But Marish has indicated at the beginning that in the re-establishment of the clinical expert reference group from the department's perspective, that one of the first tasks that that will be given would be a piece of in, evidence, evidence synthesis to, to consider how that may be carried out. Because I think, you know, a comprehensive review is warranted and, and I, I would definitely acknowledge that. So, Gorni, maybe you might like to come in there in terms of the IASP review findings. Sure, Lorraine. And again, just to reiterate at a high level what Lorraine has said, and as, as I said, the IASP review, which was a, I suppose, as, as an organisation, um, it is a, a culmination of a multi multidisciplinary association representing healthcare professionals and scientists from, from many, many countries. Um, and in March 2021, it published a meta-analysis and systematic review on the 
evidence around use of cannabinoids in uh, under the topic of pain. And, you know, I would respectfully suggest to members that if you've got an hour um, to Google it, it's really nicely constructed and broken down into the safety, the efficacy, the pre and clinical data, the, the, the animal studies and, and whether they do or do or can or cannot be translated into, into human or clinical impact. And also the societal and policy implications related to the use of these compounds for pain management. So it's an extensive piece of work by global leaders. And one of the work streams is in fact led by um, Professor David Finn of NUIG, who may be known to some of the committee members. Um, in summary, the major findings are, you know, the, the preclinical and clinical safety and um, have identified, as Lorraine has said, uh, important research uh, gaps. The lack of high quality clinical evidence for safety or efficacy uh, mean that this particular association don't endorse general use. And um, this association recognises the pressing need for studies to fill the research gap. And as I think I said at the recent private session, you know, none of us are questioning, I suppose, those for whom cannabinoids have provided relief and from the lived experience of pain. You know, in summary, it's it's about the quality of evidence here rather than the legitimacy of people's claims. So so lots lots in there. Now there was a recent um publication in BMJ um, you know, countering some of those claims, but but there is definite differences in methodologies and the methodologies used by ASP were 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 very robust. So while, you know, as a HPRA, as an entity, we're a single entity. You know, we've done a, a quick review of 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 the evidence, um, in a very general way. Um, so I wouldn't want to prejudge the outcome of a, a whole of health system expert review that might happen, um, as Marish has outlined earlier. Okay, thanks very much, Gina. Just one quick question. Very, very, very quick question, which is very important, in relation to those that have a ministerial license, which are sixty-seven individuals. At the moment, uh, they will be outside. Uh, the MCAP um, and obviously for uh, logistical reasons um, because of the product they, they get from Holland that cannot be included on the schedule and I think that could be overcome I think uh, I think Denmark have a third party uh, licensed company that actually uh, does provide that particular product to the Danish uh, medical cannabis access program but in that in this situation where you have 67 individuals them 60 individuals are obviously not monitored collectively. So in a situation, could they be included in the programme as part of the kind of uh, monitoring process? Because the vast majority of them would, would be for refractory epilepsy. But could they be kind of a part of the programme but not being prescribed the metal cannabis uh, products under the schedule, but can they be monitored uh, as part of the programme? Uh, thank you, Deputy. Kenny, I think I'll bring in uh, Anne-Marie here just uh, talk about the review of MCAP will take account of those wider uh, circumstances of those patients and, and the ministerial licence and explore how, how, how the extent to which they could be uh, uh, facilitated through, the, through a, a, a reworking of the MCAP. Uh, Anne-Marie, can you come in? Sorry, can, can I just clarify, do you mean the monitoring the, of these patients be done through the mechanisms in the MCAP or that these patients be, be supplied their products through the, the MCAP scheme? Mo monitored. Monitored, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, 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 every licence that's granted um, lays out the requirements for the clinician to monitor the patient. And that's not information that the, the department then collates. It's, it's a, a doctor-patient relationship, any adverse reactions to the products will be reported to the HPRA and the HPRA does does uh, gather all of that data. Um, but in, in terms of the clinical benefits seen from taking this product, that's not information that, that's currently gathered by us, um, but that could be could be looked at in the MCAP scheme, uh, you know, a, a way of, of gathering the information as to the effectiveness of these products. It, it's not something that, that's currently um, being considered bring those patients in. Um, as has been said multiple times already, we would envisage if Epidiolex becomes um, available for reimbursement, a lot of the patients will also leave the ministerial license scheme. So overall, the, there's the three indications that the vast majority of patients are for the refractory epilepsy. If, if Epidiolex is available, they will be gone. And our understanding is that since the MCAP was first set up, the clinical needs of patients with MS and with the severe nausea are largely met by other licensed non-cannabis 
based medicines. So we don't see a huge demand for patients with, with those um, clinical needs coming through either the MCAP or the Ministerial Licence Programme.